so this is going to be a lot of fun for me because I get to just talk instead of going through the slide deck. I'm, I've been kind of on a road show for a year since the book came out. I'm like a circus act, you know. I get brought in, taken out of my cage, I do my act, I come back in my cage and they ship me to a new city. So I was in Minneapolis yesterday, I'll be in Denver tomorrow, and then the next week I'm in three cities. The reason is that we're going through some really dramatic changes in our country. And the workplace is just a microcosm of what's going on in the bigger world. How many feel like the world is changing rapidly and even disruptive? Are any of your lives being disrupted at all by what's going on? Okay, now, now I, I learned what Minnesota nice was, which means respectful, I'm going to be, be quiet. Now, you don't have to do that, and there's alcohol here, so I'm not sure what crowd works better, a caffeinated crowd, which is in the morning, or a crowd waiting to get their drinks, or a crowd after they get their drinks. But you're welcome to interact and, and tell me where you're at with this whole conversation. Because everywhere I go... I'm talking to people who feel like they're just running twice as hard just to stay even. Is that kind of how you experience things here in Sioux Falls? Now, I know it doesn't move as rapidly here in Sioux Falls as it might in California or New York, but I know you've got to be experiencing how do we keep up. So part of what I want to do is give you some context for why our lives are crazier today than they used to be and why culture is really the key conversation we should all be having. And I want to take culture out of the fuzzy, wuzzy, you know, and take the word collaboration out of the what the hell does collaboration mean anyway? How many have a definition for collaboration in your workplace? Okay, that's what I thought. We've got one person here. Uh, because nobody really knows what it means, but it's very important. So we know it's important, but we don't know what it means. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. We're trying to chase something. We don't know what it is, but we know it's important. So I'm going to try to help demystify that a little bit as well. Um, I'm a futurist by training, by education. My undergrad is, uh, it was called social technologies. So that's the impact of technology on society and organizations. They didn't call it a futurist back then. Uh, but then I've gotten my master's in strategic foresight. I've also been in this industry since 1978. So I'll give you a little bit of background of my journey through this. Uh, my organization, I'm a futures consultancy, but I'm a practitioner. So I'm not an academic futurist. I'm actually trying to figure out how does this all work for my family and how does it work with the people I, I work with as well. So because we don't have a PowerPoint, which is great, it liberates me and I've got this huge wall. I may be sketching some things on the wall. Uh, but I'll start out a little bit of my story and how I got to this place. When I graduated from the University of Illinois, I went down to Texas with five tennis rackets and a suitcase. I'm a certified tennis professional. So I went down there to work at Brookhaven Country Club. Then I got engaged. That meant I had to grow up, which meant I had to get rid of my tennis rackets. And I got a job as a project manager in a company called Southwestern Bell, now AT&T. So I'm in the architecture and construction department. And what we were doing at that time is rapidly converting office space into cubicle space. And what I was doing was beneath the architects. They had did not want to have anything to do with cubicles. And it wasn't construction, so there was this place called project manager, and that's what I was. And we were moving rapidly into that space. Now, how many of you remember rotary dial phones? Okay, the click, 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 click. Remember all that? So it was just fortuitous that when I went to school for, I actually went to work for a company that was going through a huge technology shift. And I was watching the technology shift take place. And that technology shift, how many have seen an, an ugly AT&T building somewhere around that's just kind of no windows on it? That's a switch building. And in the olden days, that switch building had 20 foot high ceilings, 40 foot wide bays. And what was in there were these racks of analog switches. And an analog switch, if you were to describe it, it would look like a telegraph machine stacked on top of each other. So what you're hearing is all these brass armatures going click, 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 click. So when you walk into a room, imagine it's about ceiling of this high. This is about the size of a switch room. And there would be rows and rows of racks, kind of like computer racks. Only what you 
here are click, 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 click. So it was an audio version of the matrix, walking into the matrix and being bathed and all those bits and bytes, but it was an audio version. That's what you were hearing on the, your rotary dial. But then one day, um, we got this black box, and the black box wasn't quite as wide as this front po uh, rostrum here. Uh, and it was about chest high, and it was called a digital switch. And that digital switch replaced several floors of analog switches overnight. So, dramatic shift in technology. Now we're into digital technology. New capabilities meant companies were figuring out new ways to do things. So new business applications. And this little company called MCI, how many remember MCI? Founded in New Jersey, and they joked that it was basically a law firm that got into the long distance business because what they did is sued the federal government for rights to provide long distance. So now we have new business capabilities, new policies. The telephone company is broken up and, and made to be competitive, you know, and that's what we had to do. I remember having to put 650 people that were now told, you, you are no longer just telephone people, you are sales and marketing. And we put them up in Dallas at 5525 LBJ Freeway, 600 people. We had three months to push them all up there into these orange and, orange and yellow striped panels. Um, and overnight, it was a marketing company. But the culture didn't change overnight. In fact, some would question whether the culture has yet to change for these companies. And so what, what I ran into as we were moving into this cubicle world is a realization that this affects people. That all these changes, this ripple effect, because I was moving a manager out of his private office into an 80 inch high cubicle and he looked depressed almost ready to cry. And he said, young man, I was 24 at the time, he said, young man, when I came to this company right after the war, they assigned me a desk in this sea of oak desks. And last year, I finally made it to district level, third level, and I got a private office, a walnut desk, a door that closed, no windows, had privacy. I was moving him away out from a window into the open area again with an 80 inch high panel. And guess what the worktop was? What is the worktop? At oak. And worse than that, it wasn't even real oak. It was rift cut veneer. Remember the old rift cut veneer? We called it Velveeta wood uh, because it kind of homogenized. He was close to tears because his whole career and the culture was your identity and your status comes when you get into that private office. That's what people are going through. Now, how many of you in here are architects or designers? Okay, about 30% of the group. How many of you are facility managers? Okay, we've got a couple. How many are in real estate do the transactions? How many of you are business owners or, or business management? Okay, all right, what are the rest of you here doing? You just heard there was free food at the bakery. Well, let's go, let's all, okay. I, I just want a level set to know the audience. So this change is real and what you don't realize and what I started to realize later is that I wasn't really in the facility management business. I wasn't really in the project management business. Uh, I was in grief counseling. That was my primary role and job is grief counseling. How many of you have ever instituted a change or a move and, and experienced any resistance or pushback? Anybody experienced that at all? Just three people? <clears throat> okay, right. That's, so you know what that's like, but, but that's what's happening. You're poking culture. We call it shadow culture. You're poking at something there, and it's fighting back. Remember Peter Drucker's famous quote? What's Peter Drucker's famous quote about culture? What does culture do? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. This is all strategy, so this is Pac-Man. So what's happening here is we've got it backwards. Companies are really good at strategy and really good at execution. 
And if culture eats strategy, culture is never discussed on the front end of the conversation. It's never brought into what is our culture, what are we going to run into. Now part of what culture is, is who's entitled. Does anybody have any folks that feel somewhat entitled in their company? Okay. Who are the informal power leaders, the influencers? Okay. Does your company have any workarounds? Getting invoices paid or approvals? Do you have any workarounds? Because that's culture, right? All that is culture, but what happens is that when you disrupt it, culture says, no thank you. We like things the way they are, and we'll outweigh you, we'll out-torment you, we'll out-complain you, we'll just, through a thousand little water drops, it's, it's, it's Chinese water torture, and you just give in. So that's what we're running into when we, when we had that. And what we saw is that there's, there's four categories that culture fits into, okay? You've got either healthy culture, unhealthy culture, you've got default, and intentional or by design. That's it. Most companies, they have culture, they just haven't cultivated it, haven't developed it. It's already there. Every organization, every family has a culture. And the way we've defined culture is it, it's the behavior that happens when management is not present. That's my simple practitioner's version of what culture is. Okay? That is the behavior that happens when you're not present. So the first step that I work on with companies is get rid of the facade. Now, there are some people who will say our culture are our vision and value statements. And it, I, it, I don't want to actually use the words that I use to describe what kind that is, but that's the difference between, have you ever been to a very nice restaurant and you experienced the dining room area? So that's one culture, but the kitchen, that's, it's the kitchen culture we're talking about, it's the locker room culture. It has nothing to do with the marketed experience that people are going to have. Now, a few companies, a few organizations, it's highly aligned, but that's very few because most people don't actively cultivate those values. And so we're looking at values and attitudes and behaviors. We're not looking at platitudes. So we have to get it down to that visceral level. And if you can get it down to that level of attitudes, values, and behaviors, then you can intentionally move the needle from what you think the culture is or where it's currently at to where it needs to be. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. But the other part I want to focus on, too, is why this is so important. <clears throat> now, uh, the S&P 500 list, okay, S&P, 1960, today. The average lifespan of an S&P 500 company in 1960 was 60 years, okay? Today, it's now down to under 15 years and it's declining, rapidly declining. So you might want to wonder why. And 40% and of Fortune 500 companies are predicted to be gone by 2020. That's five years away. Okay? What is 40% of 500? I need to keep you guys working. <laughs> it's 200. Think about that. I was with a company last night that bought one of the companies on the S&P 500 list and took it off the list. So why are they dropping like flies? Well, this is, happens to be the 50th anniversary of a guy that all of us should know um, who made a proclamation. His name is Gordon Moore. Now, Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel, and he proclaimed in 1965 a phenomenon that has changed everything we're doing today. And that phenomenon is called Moore's Law. How many know what Moore's Law is? Because if you don't, when Moore's Law comes to your back door, be afraid. 
What Gordon Moore said is that the computing capacity of a chip will double every 18 months to two years at equal or the same cost. Now, that could sound like a throwaway statement, okay? That may feel like, okay, great. But what that means is we've entered an era of exponential change. Now, as hominids, we are designed for linear change. We can see out a week. We can see out two weeks. We can see out a month. But we cannot imagine exponential change. I'll give you a good example. If I were to give you a, a million dollars today, and Larry's ready to write the check. He told me he would write the check. A million dollars today, or I gave you a penny and, and doubled it every day for 30 days, which one would you take and why? Who would take the million dollars? Okay. Uh, who would take the penny? Now, if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you why. Okay? Jeff, why? Not quite 10 million. But if you took the million, you'd be right until day 27. Because at day 27, you would have $625,000. But it's going to double. So what's day 28 mean? So we don't have any engineers in this room. I guess we're all salespeople in this room and designers. What's, what's day 28? About 1.2. What's day 29? About 2.4. What's day 30? About 4.8 or around, right at $5 million. So that's what kills companies. They see, they don't see anything blipping above the radar that they need to look at until it's too late. Look at Kodak, for example. Okay? How many grew up with Kodak and taking pictures and film? How many remember what the word Kodak moment means? Well, now it means something completely different. It means, oh my gosh, how stupid could you be? And why do I say that? How many re re realize that Kodak invented digital photography in 1975? But in 1975, it was .001 megapixels. Okay? Your camera today is probably 10 megapixels. So what did Kodak say in 1975? Yeah, who would, who would even be interested in that? How many are film buffs? You know, used, taking regular film. I, I grew up in the film business. My dad was in charge of U.S. sales and production for Fuji's reprographics division in the U.S. I got free film and free processing. And when digital cameras came out, I said, ain't no way you'll see me using a digital camera. The quality's just not there. Now, I've got two Nikons and three Fuji sitting in the closet that I haven't used for, for five years because the quality is even better. And I can do things with it that I could never do before. So what happened is, is that they identified themselves as a film culture. And film has certain kinds of qualities and behaviors about it. I used to go and shop in the refrigerated aisles of film stores, you know, looking for all kinds of specialty film. I mean, there's a culture behind it. Had they seen themselves as a memory capture business, maybe they could have made the change. But they couldn't see it coming. It took 20 years of iterations, 1995, for the Casio QV10 to come out at only 0.256 megapixels. And that was it. Game was over for Kodak. As soon as that came out, it was too late. They couldn't catch up. So what happened was, is when day 28 came in, in, for Kodak in the digital business, they were, they were history. You cannot recover from that because it's a culture thing. It's a mindset thing. So the question we have and we're working on is that it's not strategy that messes you up. How do you adapt your culture? The new rule is this, the organizations that can adapt their cultures the fastest with the least disruption win. It's that simple. And if culture are the hidden attitudes, values, and behaviors that run the place when you're not there, then let's start with that conversation. And the first place is, what is your culture? And it's very interesting when I go around the country and talk to com companies, they typically pull out what and show me as their culture. 
what is the first thing they show me? Their mission and values. And I said, that is the Hallmark card version. Of your, but that's not what runs the place when you're not there. So let's get to that. And so that takes a little bit of ethnographic research. It's not hard to do, but that's where you have to start. And then you have to ask, what behaviors and attitudes do we need to be successful in the future? So in the book, we give a couple stories and examples of that. One of the great stories is CBRE, CB Richard Ellis, and their LA headquarters. What they were confronting is that Lou Horn saw and knew that their business was changing. And the way you can tell is if the margins are getting tighter, if the sales are getting harder, there's more effort, less return and reward, there's more competitors in it, people are starting to consider you a commodity. All of those things tell you that you know, our iceberg is melting and we need to find a new value curve. So what Lou said is that we've got to become a more team-based environment. Now, how, how many have ever been in a broker office? Do I have a broker here? Because I'm going to offend some people here. <clears throat> Good. I've only get to offend one person. <clears throat> and I I'm, I'm, I'm guarantee I'm faster than you because I've had to leave. But so here's, here's the deal. It was built on having these rock star brokers that could do the art of the deal, transactions. And so they're in, they are the franchise players. Okay? They are the, the star quarterback, the Aaron Rodgers of the world. You know, they're, they're the franchise player you build everything around. And now we have to go and tell them, not anymore, you've got to play as a team. You've got to play nice with everybody and work with everybody, and we've got to change your compensation so we can do that. That's not an easy thing. Now, I originally didn't want to go and see this story, but I have a, a colleague by the name of Chris Hood who works there in their workplace strategy group, and he said, no, you got to see the story. And I said, no, I know you guys. I know what that world is. I don't want anything to do with that. And then I went to see the story, and I said, oh, my gosh. They changed the culture. And space was a big part of it. Now, the way they changed the culture was genius, absolutely genius. Um, because you can imagine if I'm a broker and I've got my 15 by 15 private office and I've got my gatekeeper outside and I've got my selfie with me and President Clinton on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, <laughs> I've got my row of silver shovels of all the projects and I've got my sacred files that nobody knows how to access them except me because I have my own unique filing system all throughout and you're telling me that I've got to give that up for no assigned space and a new laptop? Do you think Lou Horn was going to get some resistance to that? In fact, some people said, over my dead body, his boss said, Lou, we understand we've got to change, but if you lose a broker over this, it's a career decision for you. Now, as a broker, you're basically an independent agent. You can take your business anywhere because it's your relationships. But what he did was genius. And what he did was first he went and educated himself. He wanted to see people who were doing things that looked like the future that he could build a bridge to. So he went to Amsterdam and looked at Eneco, an energy company. And there's, there's a science fiction writer by the name of William Gibson, who said the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So the secret to what I do is I look for other areas where the future's already here, and I go look and say, so what are you doing? And what are you doing differently? And then he went to their Amsterdam office and saw a very open, collegial, egalitarian culture taking place. He said, okay. He went back and asked and said, I'm going to take you on a field trip. Let's go and visit Google. So they went to Google, and what do you think they said when they saw Google? They said, that's not us. There's no way. We're not a bunch of blue-jeaned, millennial engineers, you know, drinking all kinds of herbal teas. We're not that group. But then they went to Bloomberg Financial in New York. And they said, oh, open, 
completely open. And they made the connection, financial company, fiduciary. And they saw the energy level, and they experienced and felt the energy level. And they said, OK. Then they went to Russell Financial. And they saw a completely open area, free address. And they started making the connection. Because it's something that you can't envision. That dramatic change you can't envision. It's like I'm working in K-12. And we're working with at-risk kids. And one of the things that is hard is those kids cannot imagine them going to college. They can't see themselves going to college. They have no reference point of what that is like when they come out of poverty and in the inner city. But what some schools are doing very smart, they're po posting pictures of graduates from the school that have made it to college. And they bring these kids back to tell their stories. And now a kid that came out of my environment is going to college. They're building that bridge and they're building that connection. And that's the kind of thing we have to do when we're taking companies and people through dramatic change. Is first, they have to be able to tangibly, tangibly experience and visualize what that might mean for me. You can't take them to a Google. You can't take a brokerage firm to Google and say, OK, we're going to be Google. And that's the big mistake so many designers and architects bring. They say, we want open space and collaboration. So they bring all these pretty pictures of other people. They're just not us. And they're not even in our neighborhood. So that's step one. Step two, what they did, which was genius, is they created an experimental zone for eight months. And they had these products, and they had these different applications come in and they tested and tried and every Friday they had a feedback day huge feedback day where they said this is what we learned this is what worked and this is what didn't work so very transparent and they engaged the place in that when they originally started they thought they were only going to they thought they were going to do 85 percent open and 15 percent private offices after going through this the group decided only one private office, it's the CFO. Just one private office. Then the other thing they did, which was genius, is that they digitized all of the files. And so you can imagine my 30 years of files, the way I want it. What kind of stress is that going to be when you come to me and say, you know what, we're going to put all those in the cloud. And I can't touch them, I can't feel them, I know where they all are. So they hired digital coaches for everybody. And those digital coaches help them take and scan all their files and organize it and show them how to, to access it. And one of the brokers who said that I was one of the vocal people against this in the beginning says, I'm a better broker today. I can do my work from anywhere, any place. And that came in real handy because the day I showed up was two days after they had a flood in their new space. And that flood wiped out, it was, it was very expensive, it wiped out two floors. So it happened on a Thursday, I showed up on a Tuesday. When I first came in and saw all these tarps, my initial reaction is I was disappointed. I thought, well, I came to see the new showroom and everything. But what had happened was that they were able to offsite, half the office was able to, they, they got temporary space over the weekend, and they were up and running again, didn't lose any time. And so all of a sudden they discovered we built in contingency, resiliency. We didn't even know we were trying to do that. But the flood showed that had that been the traditional, they would have been out of business for months. Completely shut down, files lost, everything. Um, so all these things went into helping condition the culture and get them to move. And that same broker shared with me, now they went, they also analyze the work of the work and we don't do a lot of that we come in with standardized rule of thumb programming you know engineer needs this much space and somebody needs that much space but what they did is they really assessed the work of the work and they went from four distinct work venues into 16 distinct work venues so today it kind of looks like you start in one area one zone and maybe a social zone where all the food is and then you kind of migrate through and work in different neighborhoods. They call legal as a neighborhood, accounting as a neighborhood, industrial as a neighborhood. And you can work anywhere you want. And this broker decided to work in the legal neighborhood that day and was working on a deal. And he ran it by a young individual that was in the office. 
and the individual said, had you considered this tax option for your proposal? Never thought of it, never would have thought of it because he would have stayed in his broker area and then it would have been handed off siloed wise for legal just to only look at it, not for input and ideas, but just to make sure there was no, no problems in it. But now it's changing the behavior. Now they're moving from, I'm just checking off accounting to let's find a smarter way to do this because of the interaction. The other thing that was mentioned too is one of the, one of the people who had been there for a while said the office feels like it got 15 years younger. So why do you think that person said that? Why did she say that? Because she was a broker who went up and went over to her broker alley and all the brokers were about the same age and they all had their private offices and they'd all closed their door and didn't need to interact with anybody else and now they're interacting with everybody. So can you see how a change in business strategy leads to a rethinking of the behaviors we need, leads to building bridges to imagine what it could be like, leads to experimentation on how it would work for us. And you know, the other thing they did too is they included 25% of the office in the decisions. They had eight distinct commi committees. They had the furniture committee, technology committee, they had uh, uh, cultural committee, they had an art committee, they've got wonderful localized art in there. They had these different committees, so now they've engaged the office and everyone's got a voice in this. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. They spent $180 per square foot for finish out. $60 a square foot was for technology. So, in, in Sioux Falls terms, that's a lot of money per square foot but they reduced their overall cost 900,000 a year. They saved $9 million on this. They have higher density, higher engagement levels. Uh, one of the colleagues from our case for space, Bob Fox with Fox Architects was there and met with the CFO and he said, how do you measure whether this was effective? Now, the $900,000 a year is, is a benchmark, but he said, I measure it in smiles. He said, people are so much happier working here. The energy level is high, people love coming in. And they also trained their receptionists at Four Seasons to be concierges. So when you walk in, you're not met with a receptionist. You're, you've got a stand-up area, and that concierge takes you to that next place and makes sure ahead of time before you come, do you need plug-in? Do you need this? Do you need that? So when you walk in, it's a different experience, a different environment, transformed. So. Um, so that's my big story, and I'm looking at the time. What I'd like to do is, is open up for about five or ten minutes of questions, but I want to get you into an exercise that I think is an important exercise for you. So before I transition into that, any questions on the culture side of change, what businesses are facing, the need to adapt? That's a great question. I think Carla found with your environment that when people saw each other, they actually modulated their voices, and so it wasn't an issue. But at CBRE, for example, they've got 16 different places you can go work. And so you can go to a private booth if you need to have private time. The other thing, too, is Cummins is very sensitive and aware that a lot of their engineers come in. Uh, they have a lot of people with Asperger's. And so part of their culture is how do we embrace, they call it invisible diversity, the diversity you can't see. Uh, it's a very conservative town, Columbus, Indiana. They're the first company in, in Indi Indiana to embrace LBGT as well. So it's an interesting mix of a very conservative but very, hu very humane environment. And what they recognize is that some of the best talent they had weren't getting promoted, it was more the extroverts getting promoted. And there's a book called Quiet by Susan Cain, which you should all read. 40, up to 40% of the workplace are introverts. 
And so that's, that's a conversation. Uh, I work with Gallup Strength Finders to look at kind of how do we tune people's in individual way of working. It's moving into schools too, individualized education. How do we work with the different kinds of creativity and the different kinds of functioning and the analyticals and the expressives and all these things. So that's a new element of complexity that we're just going to have to grow into to figure out. But um, so I think it's a matter of understanding the work of the work, having the right culture and having the right kind of with open spaces, people make a lot of mistakes on acoustics. And they put these little tin things up in, in there and, you know, the, the little tin cans that emit sound are not tuned and, and so all of that. So doing that well, and, and CBRE found that when they first went in, there was a noise issue and they came back and then reconditioned it and it, it really works fine. Now the other thing I want to bring up too before we do this quick little exercise. Um, so IBM does an annual survey, a global survey of CEOs. And this global survey said the number one thing that, that keeps CEOs up at night is um, how do I pull off a miracle this year after pulling off one last year? You know, December 31st comes and you just go, whew, made it. Now, how many of you get more budget, more time, and lower, lower quotas every year? <laughs> okay, just what I thought. So we're in this environment where it's more competitive, but we're asked to do more with less, right? And here's the challenge. Gallup does this research every year. And so you've got a CEO, and the CEO wants to get to, to this island of innovation. That's the miracle. That's the business word for miracle. And what they have in the boat, if you take 10 people, you've got three people who are happy rowing, these are all smiles, happy rowing, singing. You've got three people in your boat that are just great. They're people that I don't like to see before 10 in the morning. They're just happier than they deserve to be. Then you've got five or 50% in the boat. Okay, they're, they're happy people. They don't cause any problems. There's just one problem. You gotta tell them what to do, how to do it, and follow up and make sure they did it. You have any of those? <clears throat> and if they get stuck and they come back to you and they say, now what do I do? And what is your thought? Oh my God, my 17 year old can do this on a bad day. <clears throat> um, and so you've got those, and we call those the managed. Now here's the key part. Culture handles the managed. You don't need anything to handle these. These are, you know, you wind them up and they go. The managed, though, culture will handle the managed. And what they're looking for is basically what's expected of me around here? Where do I go to get answers to things? What are my boundaries and how am I going to be held accountable? So when I, we were at Google, um, we had one of our summits at Google. It's a great little place to go. Uh, and after lunch, I had my tray of stuff. So you put you know, the stuff in the cafeteria and then you've got trash. Now in Texas we only have two bins. You got recycle and you got the rest. And you don't even have to be real careful with, with either one. But here there were five bins all different colors. There was a yellow bin, a blue bin, a green bin, a gray bin, and a black bin. And I'm confronted with this and I'm at Google and I don't want to make a mistake. I'm, you know, I don't want to get kicked off the planet. And they have icons on what these are. I have no clue what these icons mean. And there's words like decompostable. I'm wondering, is a plastic fork decompostable? I mean, eventually, I don't know. So I'm paralyzed and helpless, not wanting to make a mistake. And a Googler comes up to me and says, here, let me show you where it goes and let me tell you why. That's culture. Google's number one value is employee experience. Number two is sustainability. And what these are asking is, what do I do and why and help me along the place? Now, if you take care of that, then management's freed up to be strategic and coaching and developmental. And then management can handle the last two on the boat. 
okay? And they're drilling a hole in the boat. They're actively trying to put you out of business. We call them the toxic 20. I mean, it's true. They're there. They're in your place. So here's the challenge we all have. Remember the, the S&P 500 drop-off? And remember the IBM, the CEOs want innovation. That's what's going to keep them from falling off the curve. But this is who's in your boat trying to get there. You've got 70% of your employees that would rather be anyplace else than your place at work today. And you've got two actively trying to put you out of business. So if you get culture right, it manages these. These stick out. We've got this affectionate name for the toxic 20. And the acronym is called Cave Dweller. And CAVE stands for consistently against virtually everything. <laughs> Do you know anybody that fits that category? And, you know, the, and when their phone number pops up on your phone, what do you do? Silence it. Yeah. You look at it and say, ah, is there anybody in your circle you have an exit plan before they actually arrive? <laughs> there, I have a few of those. Because I know it's a 90-minute conversation. It's going to be a beatdown. Whatever it is, it's a beatdown. Well, they're sucking the life out of your company to the tune of, in corporate America, $500 billion a year. $500 billion. Now, you add up the others, the 70%, and it's $1.6 trillion a year. So when you hit those numbers, my business calls the, that the oh my God factor. And that's when I get a group of leaders together and say, oh my God. First, you can't believe it, but then when you look at it and see it's true, it's the way it is, then you cannot not do something about it. I do not know why this discussion is not the number one discussion in every C-suite boardroom every week, every day, engagement. That's the secret sauce is engagement. And we can affect that by helping get the culture clear and helping identify elements in our culture that are unhealthy holding us back and identify the things in our culture that are healthy that we want to reinforce and be actively building up that part while we're weeding out the other part. The part that doesn't work is when leadership or management goes into a room and decides what they want culture to be. That never works because culture is already there. It's not that you don't have culture, it's already there. So you have to work with the culture you have. If you try to tr come in with strategy driving, culture, driving it through culture, culture will eat your lunch every time. That's why 70 to 90% of merger acquisitions fail to produce the, a higher value five years after it happens than what they were before. 70% of change initiatives fail. And it's because we don't take the culture thing into account. 